Hi there, my name is Jonathan Ginsberg. I'm a social security disability lawyer, and I'd like to talk to you about what you should expect when you're interviewing lawyers or law firms about taking your disability case. You know, I, I get a number of emails from people who basically sometimes are upset that a lawyer did not want to take their case or that a lawyer dropped their case, um, or sometimes they're upset because they couldn't even get past the call screener. So I thought it would be helpful to sort of take you behind the scenes, pull back the curtain as it were, so you understand what kind of goes on in the mind of an attorney or a law firm who does disability work when evaluating cases and some of the things you should ask uh, a lawyer when you are talking about uh, possibly hiring somebody to take your case. So first of all, from the lawyer's point of view, and again, I'm speaking for myself, obviously, um, I'd like to take every case that I, every call that I get, every person that calls me, I would like to help them. I think most lawyers who do this kind of work want to help potential clients uh, recover whatever benefits they're, they're eligible to get. The problem is we can't take every single case. And the reason for that is that lawyers in this area are paid under what is called a contingency fee, meaning we're paid only if we recover past due benefits. And the past due fee, it's 25% of any lump sum that we recover with a cap currently, and I'm recording this at the beginning of 2019, a cap of $6,000. And that sounds like a lot of money, um, and it's not insubstantial. Uh, but I will tell you that, you know, from the lawyer's point of view, this is representing three years of work, having a file in the office for three years, having to pay staff, having to pay overhead. Um, this fee, the $6,000 cap, has not been raised in over 12 years, whereas everything else goes up, the cost of copying copiers and the cost of office equipment, all that kind of stuff goes up. So we have to be very, very careful about the cases we take. So if somebody calls me and it's obvious there's not going to be past due benefits, that's not going to be a case I can take. If somebody calls me and um, there is evidence of, let's say, drug-seeking behavior, there's a person is an active alcoholic or has actively using drugs, the chances of winning are just not that great. That's not going to be a case I can really take. Um, now, from your point of view, I think it would be appropriate to ask a lawyer when you're talking to somebody, um, what do you think? Here's what my issues are. And again, you want to focus on the issues that would prevent you from working, uh, specifically the physical issues, the mental health issues, and given you, you want to give the lawyer kind of a brief overview of that and ask ask what is the theory how would you argue this what do you think is a good argument to convince a judge uh, that I would not be able to work and see what the the attorney says you know one of the things I talk a lot about here uh, in this, this in these videos are the different theories of disability meeting a listing meeting a grid rule functional capacity um, so ask the lawyer do you think I might meet a grid rule do you think I might meet a listing how would you argue functional capacity show you've done your homework but you want to ask the lawyer or law firm how they would approach it. Um, ask about the communication. How often can I expect to hear from somebody in your office? Um, am I getting copies of things? Do you have an online portal where I can log in and see what's going on? Now, the flip side of that, from again the attorney's point of view, these cases can take two to three years. And if I have a client who's calling literally every three or four days, what's going on with my case, that is not really viable for me because as much as I would like to talk to people, if I'm getting paid on an hourly basis, I'm happy to do it. But if I'm getting paid on a contingency, I can't afford to talk to somebody every week to basically say there's nothing going on with my case or what can you do to speed it along. There's unfortunately not much you can do to speed it along. So again, there's got to be sort of a, a mutual respect and give and take that I don't want somebody calling me all the time. Now, I don't mind responding to emails periodically. I don't mind an occasional phone call. You know, and I think, and I tell my, my staff people, my paralegal, reach out to our clients um, every month or two, let them know what's going on. And certainly I tell my clients, if something has changed, you're going to a new doctor, the doctor is giving you a new, new diagnosis, you definitely want to reach out to me. Um, but again, it's not something that, given that the two to three year time frame, you're not going to hear from your lawyer every week. There's nothing to report. 
And again, given that time is money, um, if you expect your lawyer to call you every week to basically say nothing is going on with this case, then your expectations are not reasonable and it's going to be hard for that lawyer to, to, retain, to remain in your case. Um, I also get very nervous, by the way, when I've had a client calls up and they've had two or three lawyers, especially if they're lawyers that I know. Um, there's a reason why a lawyer would drop a case. And if it's somebody that I know and respect, I'm going to be reluctant to take that case. So on your end, be very careful about deciding to drop your lawyer. Make sure there's a really good reason to do so. Try to work things out with the lawyer because I will tell you that for me, unless the other lawyer has withdrawn and waived fees, I'm probably not going to take that case because I'm going to have to file a fee petition, which is a, a major pain in the rear end. If the other lawyer will not waive fees, it's going to mean it's going to delay two or three years my getting paid if I get paid at all. So, you know, I'm just reluctant to take a case when uh, somebody has had two or three lawyers and the lawyers have not waived fees when they've withdrawn. I also don't really like it when somebody bad mouths their prior lawyer. Now, again, you may have legitimately had a bad experience, but if you're bad mouthing the prior lawyer, that guy didn't know what he was doing, he was terrible, blah, blah, blah. I, that's going to make me very nervous. One of the things I tell you in law school is be very careful about a client, potential client, who bad mouths his prior lawyer. Because again, the signal is that the expectations may not be reasonable. Again, right or wrong, I'm just telling you that's what lawyers think like. So that's how, how, how lawyers think, rather. So be very careful about saying anything bad. It's much better to say, we just had a difference of opinion about how to proceed. I, I, I wish him well or wish her well. I think that they're a fine attorney, but for me, I needed somebody who would be able to do X or be able to explain this or would be able to give me more time or promise me that they could be, they would, they would be the lawyer going to the hearing. Again, sometimes people go to big firms and they, you know, they're, they're going to be given an attorney, a brand new attorney uh, who may travel in and may meet the person for the first time at the hearing. You may not want that. So again, if you want a lawyer who's going to be local to you, you can come in and talk to periodically, then that may be a, be a better decision for you, but it doesn't mean that the first lawyer is not any good. Um, I'm also going to be reluctant to take a case if there's active alcohol or drug use, because those cases typically are not going to be approved. I'm also not going to take a case if somebody tells me that he or she is working under the table, they're using somebody else's social security number, they're hiding things, because again, my license is not worth one case. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to, I can't reveal that it's confidential, but I'm not going to defraud the court. We are officers of the court as attorneys, and I'm not going to do anything to uh, commit fraud upon the Social Security Administration. Um, I think that, again, when you talk to your potential lawyer, um, you want to just lay out what your expectations are in terms of communication. Um, you want to ask for a working theory of the case. You want to ask how the lawyer obtains evidence, what type of evidence he or she obtains. Uh, now, some people say, well, should I ask the lawyer what his winning percentage is? Uh, again, to, you can. Uh, my feeling, though, is that, that you know, a good lawyer is going to take challenging cases. You know, I don't win every single case I take because I take cases that are a little more difficult sometimes. So, you know, I may not win every single Single case, but you know what I'm mostly focused on is am I winning the cases that I expect to win? And most of the time, that's the answer to that is yes. But you know, it's I think it's a it's a false uh, metric to ask a lawyer how many cases are you are you what percentage are you winning because anybody could just take the winning cases. You want somebody who's going to take something a little bit more challenging. Um, the key thing is is your lawyer going to be prepared? And you might want to ask about the staff situation. How many paralegals do you have? I mentioned the on online portal. That's something we're starting to do where you can log in and actually look at the documents in your case file. Um, that just gives you a little more feeling of control of what's going on. Um, so those are some of the things that I would say are relevant to the communication uh, between you and a possible and your potential attorney. Um, I think there should be a good communication. And again, I think it's perfectly reasonable to expect to talk to your lawyer periodically, uh, to have your, his, his or her email address. Uh, not going to say I don't think giving giving out the cell phones or you're going to get that, but certainly an email address and having an ongoing dialogue with that person's paralegal. Um, and again, if you need to talk to the lawyer, the 
lawyer is going to be available to you. But again, this is not the type of practice area where you're going to hear from your lawyer on a weekly basis or a daily basis just because the, the time frames just don't, don't allow for that. Um, so those are some of the things I think that should be part of the dialogue between you and a potential lawyer uh, that you're talking to. Um, and again, I think this has got to be a two-way street. You've got to have reasonable expectations and your lawyer has got to provide reasonable communications. And if you do that and everybody's on the same page and your lawyer is prepared, you'll get a, the, most, the best possible re representation. Uh, again, no guarantees because a lot of this depends on who the judge is and how the judge reviews the evidence. But as long as your lawyer is prepared and you get everything out uh, about your claim for disability, that's, th that's what you're hoping for. That's what you're looking for. And you want to feel that your lawyer is on your team, on your side to do that. So I hope you found this helpful. Uh, let me know what you think. Are there other things I didn't mention that you think a lawyer ought to be able to help you with or tell you about or what level of communication do you think is reasonable uh, leave me a comment here uh, if you, again if you like this give it a thumbs up on YouTube like it on Facebook comments uh, are welcome on Facebook and on YouTube and if you've not already done so go to my website ssdanswers.com uh, you can get my free secrets to winning disability survival kit you can get a free case evaluation if you're not represented happy to chat with you about that and if I can be of help to you please reach out to me directly again my name is Jonathan Ginsberg and I wish you the best. Thanks a lot. Hi, this is Jonathan Ginsberg and I hope you found this video helpful. If you'd like to know more about how to win your Social Security Disability case, I'd like to invite you to download my Secrets to Getting Approved Early Survival Kit that I created just for people like you. Currently, I'm making the survival kit available at no cost and I encourage you to grab your copy now. Some of the topics I cover include, how do I know if I have a case? Is it the right time for me to file my claim? Nine common mistakes that can doom your case. The three must have arguments you use to win your case. And a topic that every disability claimant wants to know, how to avoid trick questions from the judge. If you or a loved one need to win social security disability benefits, you'll find the survival kit essential reading. Download your survival kit right now and at no cost. Just visit ssdanswers.com backslash survival and sign up. It's that easy. Please act now. And as always, I wish you the best.